first of all, let me start off by, by saying thank you for joining. Thank you for being part of Meetup. It gives me tremendous amounts of, of, of appreciation for what, everything that everyone does. Um, is there anyone that could read the Hebrew on my shirt over here? Can you see that or not? Anyone want to say it out loud? Do what you it's love. A <laughs> Do what you love. This is a, a t-shirt from we, from we Were. And as soon as I saw it, I thought to myself, I had to have it. Um, I really want to make this interactive. So the best thing you could do is interrupt me throughout. So I'm just going to plow to the next slide, um, Risa, if you don't mind. Okay. First, I want to start off with the story of Meetup's founding. Because you can't understand a company unless you understand like what our founding story actually is. So it happened actually directly after 9-11, believe it or not. After 9-11, our founder, Scott Heifman, saw the devastation that it had for people from a psychological perspective, saw people kind of staring into space, um, leaving their rooms by themselves and just congregating together in the lobby of his building. In his lobby, he met like three or four different people from his floor that he had never met before, even though he'd been living in that same building for many years. And he looked around and he said, it shouldn't take a tragedy to get people to build community. It shouldn't take a tragedy for, to find ways for people to come together to support each other. Within a few days, believe it or not, he actually did this whiteboard session right here, all the way back in 2000, um, uh, at, in, in late 2001, early 2002, we're celebrating a 20 year anniversary around right now. And it's not too different than what Meetup is today. If you go to the next slide, And this was the original meetup. If you remember the red and white on the on the top the top left corner, this was the first um, this, the first uh, homepage that we had as a company. What is a meetup and why is a meetup? If you go to the next slide. And meetup was used for a lot of different reasons. And when I tell people the reasons for it, people are shocked. But the number one use of meetup when it first started in two thousand two was for witches, people that practice witchcraft, to find each other. So you don't get much more niche than that. It's, it's, it, was, it was a congregant of people that were interested in witches and paganism and extra host witnesses and, and vampires. And um, it, was, it was very, very niche. And then a major thing happened in the company to get it to the next level. And what happened was po politicians started using Meetup. And there was a little known politician who was running for a senatorial seat back at when no one had heard of him before. And it was actually Barack Obama. Barack Obama said, if anyone, can, if, if, if anyone could get a meetup group for at least a thousand people in the state of Illinois, then I will show up at that meetup event. And he did. And Barack Obama helped to actually put meetup on the map, which is kind of another you know, an interesting tidbit of our history. Please keep going. Okay, Meetup's entire purpose is to cure the loneliness epidemic that exists in this world. 46% of people regularly feel lonely, and this is data from before the pandemic, before the pandemic, 46%. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that 62% of people who are millennials, 62% regularly feel lonely. Going to the next one. Twenty-five percent of people don't even have one trusted confidant. One in four people don't have a single person—a brother, sister, father, mother, sibling, friend—that they could go to as a trusted confidant. And that's really terrifying. If you go to the next one, eighty-nine percent of people said their last interaction was interrupted um, by some social media in some way. And Meetup. Go to the next one. Is essentially the cure for the loneliness epidemic. It is the building of community. 56 million people worldwide use Meetup, 300,000 plus groups, 100,000 events every week, including online and in person. I'm happy to answer questions about how we pivoted during the pandemic, if that's something that comes up. In 10,000 cities in over 190 countries. We are not in North Korea. But we're basically in almost every country besides North Korea. And now Israel. In Israel, we have 250,000 members in Israel over 1,500 meetup groups. And we have 
you know, 70 to 100 or so meetup events every week. And, you know, that's a start for a small country. It's something that we're proud of. You go to the next one. The number one KPI for us, most companies, the KPI, the key performance indicator is all about like revenue, all about profit. For us is the number of connections that we create as a company. Our KPI is 30 million. We make on average pre, per year, 30 million connections between people, whether it's going to a hiking meetup or a tech meetup or a language meetup, learning Hebrew if you're in China or learning Chinese if you're in Israel, we build connections between people, ideally IRL, but if not, then obviously online as well. Today, before Omicron hit, we were about 75% back to in-person, 25% online. Texas is like 95% in-person because Texas is Texas. Um, but in, in many other places, obviously we're, we're far lower, especially in Europe right now. In America, we're much more in-person. In, in Europe, we're, we're, we're increasingly more online because of Omicron. Please keep going. And it's become our, our mission. Our mission is about empowering personal growth through real human connections, helping people to find community. And that's what we're about. Go to the next one. Okay, so the pandemic hit. And Meetup's number one reason for rejecting an organizer was because they wanted to do things online. In fact, our founder, Scott Heiferman, went to a, a WeWork event and he famously took a, a VR headset, threw it on the ground, took a sledgehammer, and start smashing it to pieces because he was so against anything that was online. We talk about how we use technology to get people off of technology. But what happens when you can't have people in person like during the pandemic? So what we did is we had a massive decrease and then we suddenly saw um, all these people leaving and we were terrified for our future after 20 years. We got all of our engineers in together. We also had sold the company out of WeWork at the time. And within a week, we created a solution for to enable meetup events online. Since that time, we have actually had to go to the next one. That's RSVPs going down, keep going. Since that time, we basically have had over 5 million online events and over 30 million people attending online events. And we have online and we have in person. And you can see Tel Aviv and Israel, go back one slide actually, just to show, I wanted to highlight it, are increasingly going up just as September. You know, Omicron hit, so it started going down a little, a little bit, but you could see how much Tel Aviv was actually going up November, December, and it would have kept going up. Same with Israel, if Omicron, Omicron hadn't hit, and it's just gonna keep going up from there. So we feel really good about everything going on in Israel and really around the world. Okay, keep going. So last thing about Meetup, and then we're gonna go into um, what the book is really about, which is the story of Meetup, but also the story uh, of using kind of what happened during the sale of Meetup out of WeWork as a, as a way to help to understand how to help people make smarter and better decisions. So we were owned by WeWork, we were owned by Adam Newman. Adam Newman was, my interview, I had numerous vegan meals with Adam uh, and hummus and everything else. Uh, we talked about Torah and, and lots of other things and uh, you know, significant numbers. I, we, I, blew, I blew Shofar with, 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 with Adam Newman in his office, lots of crazy stories kind of with Adam that I could go into stories if, if you, that's something that you're interested in hearing about. And then we required from someone named Kevin Ryan. Kevin Ryan is the founder of Business Insider, MongoDB, Gilt, Zola, and all these others. Kevin is someone who I met 25 years ago, 25 years ago in my, in my first job out of college when I was 23, as 24 years ago, when I was 23 years old, I'm 47 right now. And he was the CEO of DoubleClick and I was a peon a couple years out of school, kind of early employee at DoubleClick. And then fast forward, we kept in touch all these years for 24 years and I got him to acquire the company out of Adam in the same in March of 2020 during the pandemic so it was such an insane experience I decided to write a book about it so you go to the next page and this book the book is called Decide and Conquer and ultimately what it does is we talk about the existential crises that Meetup had gone through so first in 2018, we were sold into WeWork and that was a crisis in itself because our cultures were so man hugely different. Then 2019, 
Meetup had so many challenges with WeWork's culture. Um, um, some of the uh, ways in which they approach managing people, drinking parties, all the other stuff that we had people quitting left and right just because of things that were going on with WeWork actually. 2020, WeWork fell apart, went from a $47 billion valuation down to a few billion dollars and everyone's stock kind of went away and we, were, we had to divest the, com divest the company. And 2021, the crisis of course was the pandemic that we had to live through during that time. So it was just crisis after crisis. And, and we went from, to give you an idea, an $18.5 million loss in 2019 under WeWork to a $3 million positive profit in 2020 after WeWork had divested us, which is a $21.5 million swing. And the book is kind of about all the, crazy, all the decisions that we had to make and processes to, to go from, you know, from a close to $20 million loss to a $3 million business that could be sustainable during a pandemic. And ultimately, every one of us makes thousands of decisions every single day. We don't realize how many decisions we're making. Even as a CEO, deciding what I'm going to make a decision about is a decision. Not making a decision is a decision. So my dream was, you know, I teach at Columbia and I teach entrepreneurship and strategy and I could, you know, interact with my 70 students and really build relationships with them. And that's wonderful. But the reason for the book is to be able to reach a larger swath of people to help to teach them as help to teach them as well about decision processing. So let's get back, get into it on the next slide. And actually before that, I know we started a little bit late. Everyone hopefully loves David Letterman top 10. So before I do my David Letterman top 10 list of principles for smarter decision-making, do you have one or two questions from something that I talked about already, or should I jump right into the decision-making step? You tell me. That was a decision. I decided that we're gonna open up for questions before we go into the top 10, top 10 David Letterman um, decision-making processes. So what do you wanna know before I, before I get into decisions or should I go right into this? David, I'll jump in. What made you take the job at Meetup? Okay, great. So a couple of things. Um, first of all, you know, careers are funny in that when you've been working for 25 years like me, so much of your career is about relationships that you've developed over time and people that you've met. So there's, I see Ari Kalman on here and a lot of people know Michael Eisenberg, if you're from Israel, um, who's the founder of Aleph and a big investor in Lemonade and a whole bunch of other you know, really successful Israeli companies. So actually someone on the phone on this call, his brother introduced me to Michael Eisenberg about seven years ago. I became the CEO, the, the president of Seeking Alpha, which was an investment prior to becoming CEO of Investopedia. And then Michael was on the board of, we, a board of WeWork and he called me up and he said, hey, David, are you interested in becoming the CEO? And I immediately said, wow, that's my dream job. And the question is like, why is that a dream job? Number one is because I am obsessed with the power of interactions with people and that all good things happen. Marriages, best friends, careers, um, uh, philanthropic opportunities all happen when you're interacting with people. I also so deeply believe and have seen like the power of meeting people who are different from you and that there's so much xenophobia and racism and anti-Semitism and, and hate in this world. But when people get together and they meet each other, the ignorance goes down and the accepting of other people go up. So for me, it was like a life calling. I was like, oh my God, this is like from God. That was one reason. And the second reason, I just wanted to jump on that we were crazy train and just see what it was about. So we were crazy train was kind of appealing to me and the rocket ship part of it. And second was meetups mission was incredibly appealing to me as someone who had already kind of successfully sold a company and I'd done quite well financially because of that. The next step for me was not financial, you know, priority, but kind of meaning and noble cause priority. So that's why meetup really appealed to me. Any other questions or want me to jump right into the decision principles? So jump right in. Okay, let's Very do interesting. it. Interesting. 
10. David Letterman, here we go, number 10. Next slide. Okay, optionality. So oftentimes in decision-making, people don't take into account enough, enough. They think about it a little bit, they don't think about necessarily enough that when you make a decision, you could either create many options for yourself or you could decrease the number of options for yourself. And I'll give you an example. Let's say you're great in math and you wanna go in finance, into finance. So you could, you're deciding, let's say, between going becoming an investment banker potentially, or you become a trader. If you become a trader and you're starting to trade commodity stocks, et cetera, and you start doing that for one, two, three years, the, the, the job that's most open to you after that is to be a trader. And it's very hard to go from trading to another role. For investment banking, however, everyone wants to hire a person who works in investment banking for two or three years. And the opportunities are just tremendously open up for oneself in investment banking. So when making a decision, one of the most important things that I try to talk to people about is the number of options that you're creating for yourself from that decision. So I worked in consulting, consulting tends to create many, many options for oneself. And what I believe is that decisions can drive being lucky. Your decisions will, can result, actually you can, you could create your own luck as ridiculous as that sounds. I don't wanna sound like a Tony Robbins, like crazy person. Not that he's crazy, unless you watch the Netflix show on Tony Robbins, then you might think that. But, but I've had a very lucky life and lucky career, but so much of the things that have happened to me are because I've put myself in situations where there's keeping in touch with the former CEO of DoubleClick for 24 years, or other things that you just end up having luck happen to you because you're constantly setting up decisions that you're keeping many, a lot, many different options open. So number 10 advice is focus on optionality in decisions. Let's go to number nine. Number nine. Again, I don't think this gets enough prioritization, which is the difference between being kind and being nice as part of making What do I mean? It's not a nice quote unquote thing to do, but potentially let firing someone, if you do it the right way, could be the kindest thing that you can do. And I think oftentimes people get confused between being kind and being nice. They're like, oh, I don't want to give feedback to this person that could make them feel bad. And that's not nice. As part of the kindest thing you could do sometimes is make a decision that makes people actually feel a little bit worse at that particular time. And you're enabling them to be more successful. It's like when people say like, you know, that person is such good friends to me. They will tell me that. During your decision-making. And that will also serve you really important purposes. In the book, I give examples of all these different things. I'll give some examples coming up, but these are like 10 kind of principles that come out of the book. Number eight. Okay. What I have seen more, most often, especially by people who are more recently out of college, more junior within five years, maybe even five to 10 years in their careers, is that they are not bold enough. They are too, they, they focus to mitigation there's the analysis paralysis that goes into people's work. And, and it's important to recognize whether you might be too bold or not bold enough. But again, most people that I have found make the mistake of being too risk-taking and, and that keeps them from being able to move quickly enough. And being bold in decision-making is you know, incredibly, incredibly critical. Um, Bold doesn't mean unrealistic. So for example, at WeWork, this is you know, a story from the book, we actually had to keep at Meetup two different financials that we would present to WeWork. One was called the Adam Newman financials, okay? Where we would, where we would kind of show a trajectory from you know, $40 million to a billion dollars in a few years. And one was like the real um, trajectory for the company in three or four years, because Adam was so focused and served him well for a period of time on, um, ultimately didn't, but 
on, on like ridiculously bold actions to be taking that it was so unrealistic. And the problem with that, for example, is at Meetup, he ended up before I was there setting these goals for people and the goals were completely unachievable. We were like 0 for 10 in every single goal. And it was so demotivating for people to be working on goals that were just impossible to be able to achieve. So be bold, but don't be completely unrealistic, you know, like, 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 like that. And like, like the Adam examples and understand that, that most of the time people make the mistake of being too risk averse and not risk taking enough. Let's go to number seven. Okay. Speedy is important. Everyone else tells you make decisions quick. It's better to make, make you know, fast decisions than necessarily great decisions. I'm sure you've heard that before, but let me explain really why. Smart decision-making, if you read the Lean Startup or any other things, is about making a decision, learning from that decision, iterating on the decision, pivoting from the decision, and then making another decision. The reason why being speedy is so important is because so often our decisions end up being wrong. And the speedier the decision that you make, the quickly you can iterate on the decision. The goal is like speed to iteration. And really, again, throughout my career, I, the decisions that I've had to make have been incredibly fast, oftentimes, sometimes more gut. And, and people are reluctant to make decisions because they think that decisions oftentimes are trap door decisions, meaning if the door is trapped and and you can't get out of it, but very few decisions are actually trapdoor decisions. Having a child, that's a trapdoor decision. Getting married for many people, not all, but for many people is a trapdoor decision. There are very few business decisions, however, there are true trapdoor decisions. And recognizing the fact that many decisions can be changed, revised, if you do them quickly enough, is oftentimes a, just a very important practice versus, again, the, 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 the lack of iteration that can occur from, from not as strong decisions. That's number seven. Let's go to number six. Okay, be confident. And my, my, my advice on the confidence side around decision-making is that there's a spectrum. And think about where you are in that spectrum. You can even put into chat if you want to, where you are in that spectrum or recognize for yourself where you are. There are many people that of course have imposter syndrome and, and lack confidence. And they need to figure out what they need to do to be more confident to make smarter decisions. And then there are other people who are just way overly confident and they just surround themselves by people who will debate and disagree, but know where your confidence level is gonna have a dramatic impact on your decision-making process. Know where you are in your confidence level and that will directly impact who you need to surround yourself by if you're very, very confident, you surround yourself by also very confident people so they could debate and disagree with you and hopefully then you come to the right decision. If you're lacking confidence, they need to figure out how to get to the right place. But if you surround yourself by massively confident people, you might be um, not have a voice in that opportunity. So know where you are on the spectrum around confidence. Let's go to number five. Okay, so it's always a question for people when making a decision around how much they should prioritize the long-term versus the short-term. It's always a question. Something benefits me in the short-term, but it could be bad for the long-term, so long-term, short-term. I'm not gonna give you like, they're both important because that's like not helpful. What I have found in decision-making through the years is that people actually at executive levels tend to over, inter interestingly, oftentimes over-prioritize things that could happen. Things that could happen in six months, things that could happen in a year, things that could happen in two years. When in reality, they don't, you know the data and you know the information about the decision that you're making right now and the impact it's gonna have, have right now. You have far less insight into what is going to happen in six months or a year but you're assuming the number of assumptions that you're making about six months, a year, two years is so much more significant that the likelihood of your decision being accurate or your forecasting being accurate around short term is dramatically greater than, than the likelihood of being successful in the long term just because of the, speed, the, the information that you have at your disposal. So 
perhaps it's controversial, I don't know, but I think that again, people should focus more on the short-term impact and not too much on the what if, what if, what if, because you get lost in the what if. And lots of times that what if could be a totally different scenario than what you're actually in right now. Let's keep going for the last four. I'll tell a couple of stories. Number four, this is a picture of Fred Wilson. Fred Wilson is the famous, famous um, um, founder of Union Square Ventures, and he was an early investor in Mida. I want to tell a story about a challenge that I actually had in trying to sell the company. So I met with Fred, and he was very keen on making the acquisition and of Mida when we work started the sales process. And Fred and I met numerous times, we went through all the data, he was excited. And then he said to me, David, the only thing that's gonna make this decision or break decision is you. I acquire companies because I have faith in the CEO and I believe the CEO is the right person. And I, um, and I don't acquire companies if I don't think it's the right person. I'm like, okay, great. Everyone loves me. We're in good shape. He ended up talking to, and I kid you not, this is like a real learning for me about how much due diligence goes into a CEO of a company. He talked to 12 to 15 people. I got calls from these people I hadn't worked with in 10 years, 15 years, some cases, 20 years, five years. He talked to 12 to 15 people. He called me up and he said, I'm not going to proceed with acquiring WeWork, Meetup. And I said, wow. Um, okay, uh, what happened? He said, you know, I talked to a lot of people and you're just such a binary figure. <laughs> I didn't realize that was that binary. Most people love you, but there's a number of people that really don't like you. And of course, I didn't find out who it was or, or, or what, but I, I knew that in my career, unfortunately, I have had to let go <laughs> through the years, maybe three, 400 different people through the years. That's a lot of people. And um, I think there's been times in my career that I've not done as good a job in providing feedback prior. Um, people could have been surprised. Sometimes there were mass layoffs that maybe could have been avoided potentially. And um, it was an important learning for me about you know, mistakes that I think I've made in my past and the need for me to be honest with those mistakes and learn from those mistakes. And it was, it was helpful for me from a decision-making standpoint. So I wanted to kind of share that story from a transparent standpoint as, as a leader. And we missed out on having an amazing potential owner, though Kevin Ryan's even better. So I'm very happy that, that that worked out the way it did. Okay, going to number three, the last three. Okay, so one of the stories that I'll, I share in the book as well is about early in my career where I prioritized what was good for me and for my career in a particular company versus what was actually in the best interest of the company. And I share a lot of examples about mistakes that I made and things like that. And this is an example of that. So I was the um, head of business development for a company called Duane Reed, which is a huge pharmacy chain in New York, ended up getting acquired by Walgreens for $2 billion. And at the right young age of, I don't know, 28, I had 50 to 100 people working for me in a business that we created called Duane Reed Express. And what Duane Reed Express was, was back in 2008 when video conferencing didn't even work or exist much at all. Um, it enabled people rather than going to pharmacy chain to go once, wait for, wait for their prescription, go back, drop it off. It enabled them to actually speak to a pharmacist through video conferencing where we placed 200 kiosks around the New York area and hospitals and physician offices. It was a really innovative, creative thing. Got a, a ton of write-ups on it, but the technology was failing and failed too often. But out of um, hubris and poor decision-making, I ended up wanting to push forward and grow the business and keep growing the business from 100 kiosks to 200 kiosks to 250 kiosks. Ultimately, a new CEO came in, they shut the business down, they fired me. And it's an important learning around kind of 
making decisions that are not right for the business, they always come back. And it's, and I've learned to just really try to, I'm not going to give examples that I did things great because I'd really rather talk about mistakes that I've made because I think you'll learn a lot more from mistakes and failures. But, but I think the more that you can make decisions that are ultimately in the best interest of the company and of the business, um, and not, it, it, it will all come back to roost and people will always know whether something's in your best interest or company's best interest. Let's go to the last two around decision-making. Number two, no decision surprises. Okay, so one of my huge mantras in management as a CEO is I never need, I should never have my board be surprised. I don't want them being surprised negatively, but I also want them being surprised positively either. I don't want them finding out that rather than having, you know, $2 million in profit or $5 million in profit, we actually had $10 million in profit. Like that's a surprise too. And sometimes you don't want to have necessarily that much profit. So, you know, positive surprises you think are really great. You know, Joey Levin, who's this founder, who's the CEO, excuse me, not founder of IAC, founder is Barry Diller. And I, I was the CEO of Investopedia before. But Joey Levin used to always say to me, he'd say, David, I don't want you beating your number by a lot, ever. I want no surprises. And we used to reforecast every month. And, and in my career, I've at times surprised people. I've at times been surprised. An example of when I was surprised actually dramatically is when I was a CEO of Investopedia prior to, which is the world's largest financial education site, prior to um, becoming the CEO of Meetup. This is crazy. It's hard to believe this, but we grew the company. It was great from $11 million to $35 million in revenue in, 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 in about three and a half years. It's a company that had been around for 15 years. We tripled the company's revenue, increased the profit. A company came around, talked to IAC. They acquired Invest, and they basically called me up one day and they said, David, we decided to sell Investopedia. I was not I was a CEO. I wasn't even part of the sales process. And today's going to be your last day. And then, by the way, that's when Michael Eisenberg called me a couple of days, a couple of days later, by the way. Um, and it's an example where I was massively surprised. And I said to myself, I will never surprise someone else. It is so terrible to have your employees be surprised. And I think as a management mantra, a decision-making process, thinking about how can I eliminate surprises up, down, all around to my colleagues, to my leaders, to my people who work for me is a very important part of decision-making and communication around it. And last one, number one, around decision-making, you know, from the book is understanding your biases. I'm not gonna go in detail about all four of these, but I'll just talk about the four co most common ones. And again, go in a lot more detail in the book, but recency bias. So there's a reason why anyone who does yoga, you do a Shavasana, which is basically lying on your back at the end of a yoga, because even you're doing all these crazy stretches and you're all over the place and, and it might not be the most enjoyable experience, but people have recency bias. People remember the Shavasana. People remember that they were lying and breathing and relaxing at the end. And that for them is what they associate with yoga. And they want to do it a second time or a third time because that recency bias is, happens all the time. It also happens recency bias. I find if I let go of an executive, let's say, because they weren't aggressive enough, my recency bias is, oh, I need to hire someone who's super aggressive. I, if I let go of someone because they were... Um, too aggressive, and you hire someone who's going to be less so. People overemphasize the exact recent experience to so significantly a degree in decision making, it's terrifying. And understanding that bias is the first step towards that. The second bias is around confirmation bias. So I do this all the time. When stocks go up, I look at my portfolio, I'm like, oh man, David, you're the best investor. Man, I'm so proud of myself. I don't know if anyone else says this. And like in the last week or so, the stocks have gone down. I don't even want to look at what my 401k looks like. I don't want to look like what my portfolio looks like because like, I don't want to see all the losses. But what happens then is that I'm only giving myself visibility to when I'm doing a good job. And I think I'm better at, let's say, investing than I am. And I'm not a very good investor. I should just invest in the S&P 500. Like everyone should invest in that. Um, and confirmation, uh, excuse me, confirmation bias is just obviously a huge bias that other people have. Next one is status quo bias. We talked about that. People don't realize that not making a decision is making a decision. They think that, 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 that keeping things status quo is, allows you to do things you know, later on and they're afraid of change. Well, in reality, you are making potentially the worst decision 
by keeping status quo or keeping the job that you're in that status quo and it's dangerous. And last but not least is just sunk cost fallacy. A personal example for myself is I go to a fancy restaurant, there's a bunch of food that comes up because I just spent, you know, Israel terms, let's say 400 shekel on like a meal, it's a lot of money. I'm gonna eat every morsel of that. I'm stuffed and I'm still eating all my food because I just want to get as much as I can. I don't realize that the reason why I got the food was to be happy. I don't think about the sunk cost of it. And I think so many people don't under, don't think enough about the fact that things are sunk cost in the decision-making processes. And the more that they can realize that it's gone, the time is gone, the money's been spent. Now, what's the right thing to be doing moving forward? And these are four common biases. There's lots of other biases that I go into, obviously in the book as well. But those are some, bias, some biases I just wanted to highlight as well. Understand your biases and, and then figure out how, what you need to do to counteract them. That's number one. Go to the next slide, please. So here are my top 10 decision-making biases, thinking about op optionality, being kind to decision-making, pushing yourself to be bolder in decision-making because most people are too risk averse, the benefits of speed decision-making versus, versus you know, greater diligence around it, confidence, understanding where you are in that spectrum, focusing on where you have more data and information in the short term, honesty and transparency about yourself and mistakes that you've made, doing what's right for the business, you know, not just, not just obviously what's right for, for, other, for, for yourself and not to have surprises and understanding your biases. Those are my top 10 decisions. Going to the next one. If you want to get it, maybe you don't anymore. That's okay. If you want to get it on Amazon, if you're in, you know, if you use Amazon, then the Kindle, the book, the Audible, then you could scan the QR code in the top left corner. Book depository, I highlighted because if you're in Israel, um, they have free shipping around the world. So um, you can go to book depository QR code right there, and it's free shipping uh, to Israel as well. Or for anyone who's not in Israel, it's also free shipping to there. Um, and you could look into, into that. Go to the next one, please. Most of you guys don't like giving their emails out, but you know what? I love hearing from people. So my email is david at meetup.com. Pretty darn easy. And um, you can also send me a LinkedIn invite. And I would certainly love to hear you know, from you about anything. That wraps up the discussion around meetup, discussion on the loneliness epidemic, discussion on our impact. And it also um, hits on you know the decision principles that kind of we focus on in the book, and I would love to hear any questions. David, David, David. First of all, thank you, thank you so much for this very insightful session. I would love to hear from Uri. Do you have a question? I saw you unmuted yourself first. Yeah, yes. Okay. So first, uh, I see that Yossi raised his hand. So let's yeah, go after first. you have Yossi, no worries. <laughs> no, Uri, thank you so much, Toda. All good. Um, all yeah, my, my question, David. So first of all, thank you for that. Um, I, I've met Scott uh, when he was in, in Israel a few years ago, and I'm a community manager of Meetup for, for, for many years. Amazing. And most on the most on the on the startup founder stuff, etc. Uh, my, my question is, I remember when I've met Scott, he, he was talking about growth, growth, growth. And then I, you know, with your new figures, I mean, I see that you have already to that point. Uh, uh, do, do you work on, on, on a kind of platform where you will, you know, open a kind of API for other startups and companies to add extensions and add opportunity uh, and add other uh, uh, features on, on Meetup? I mean, it means it means to be the good time. Don't you think so? I think so completely. Um, it's funny. We just moved from a uh, to a GraphQL API, a much, much better API that's much easier for people to leverage. If you're interested in how to take advantage of our GraphQL API, and we have roughly a few hundred P, um, um, organizations that embed meetup data, meetup locations, meetup events, meetup groups into their technologies. Um, if that's something you're interested in, send me an email. Um, we wanna do more and more of that. We wanna really help to serve and expand the number of people who can create apps uh, related to kind of our data and our information and you know our events and our groups so it's we actually just invested a lot in a much better apis to enable that so 
Um, 100%, um, please, please let me know. And I'd love to see how we could we could work, work together around it. Sure, thank you for that. I will send an email and, and unfortunately we won't have a dinner this week sometime uh, all together, I, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm around really, if, if you have some time. God, you know, Bezrat Hashem, God willing, I will come back in March or April, um, likely, and then we could hopefully set up a dinner at that time. And then, you know, Omicron will be far gone by then and we're going to have, we're, <laughs> we're going to have a great time. Nice. Thank you. Thank you. See. Uri, go for it. Uh, I, thanks. So uh, I wanted to ask about uh, the no decision surprises. So uh, I think one of the most notorious one and, you know, happened to me in, in several companies that I happened to in the fa in the I worked with in the past is obviously huge layoffs with, with the company shutting down either partially or completely. And it's something that uh, sometimes as an employee, you can read the signs, but no one will tell it explicitly. So, so kind of how, how do you manage to balance that? Because that I would say is the ultimate bad surprise in, in surprise. business. Ultimate surprise. Everyone in this room no longer has a job anymore. Like that's happened to me, by the way. Um, so here's what I would say. One of the most important interview questions that I asked years ago because it happened to me at a younger at a younger age is are you do you share the, the financials with all employees or not are you transparent with the company's financials are you transparent with the burn rate are you transparent with how much cash is in the company are you transparent or not and i've actually turned down jobs when i was ju more junior when you're ceo you get to decide the transparency but when, when i was more junior because companies were not transparent in their financials. And when a company is not transparent, it's a huge red flag. If you don't know how much, the burn, how much the burn rate is, what the priorities are for the company, what the key KPIs are. So we as a company have our CFO stand up in front of the entire company and we share freaking everything. One of our values called trust and transparency, we share revenue, we share EBITDA, we share cash, we share operating expenses, we share number of employees, we share number of open positions, we share diversity statistics, we share everything with the company. And the reason I say this and emphasize it so much, Uri, is because if you work for a company that's going to keep information behind closed doors, the likelihood of being surprised is frankly much, much higher. So if you choose to lead a company, one of the most important, so I had an amazing opportunity, Uri, and everyone else, to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the famous Jack Welch. The Jack Welch, the founder of General Electric, and who was actually listed by Time Magazine as the manager of the century, of the century for the 1900s. I sat down with him and I said to him, you're the best manager that ever existed. What is your advice? He said, the most important thing you could do is be transparent with your employees in order to build trust. If your employees trust you, that's everything. So, so I guess my answer to you is be transparent about everything work for a company that has a culture of transparency and you're not going to have those kind of surprises or you have a far greater chance of those surprises unless some outside thing hits like, oh, I don't know, a two year long pandemic. But even then have transparency of what the company's doing and what the impact of that is you know, during that pandemic. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Paz, would you like to ask your question? Sorry, Pat. I couldn't read it because I'm on the phone, but I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll read it Hi, to you shortly. I know I saw the question from Ari. Um, I'll let Paz ask her question and then I will ask you Ari's question. So I'm completely a novice. I come from London. I was very intrigued in terms of your slide shows and you don't uh, meet the CEO every day. So I jumped on the opportunity. My question was the importance of a niche in terms of the next step and how you would transition from that. What advice would you give somebody who's really at that novice stage in terms of their qualities, their passions, and putting that forward? Thank you. Great. Okay. I actually, I, I do have a strong opinion about this one because I, as I said, I, I've been teaching for seven years at Columbia Entrepreneurship, and I get that question from students all the time. Um, your ability to create an amazing product and service is dramatically higher the more niche your product is. 
a lot of time venture capital firms and others are afraid of more niche type businesses because the market opportunity is always smaller the more that the niche exists. So you need to be cognizant of the fact of how big a potential opportunity is. But, but I think the mistake that most founders have is that they, and one of my favorite lines is startups more often die from indigestion than starvation. They die from doing too many different things, not choosing a niche, not choosing a focus in the bullseye, and then extending that focus from the red to the orange, to the yellow, to the green, to the blue, you know, from archery terms. And they try to be too broad. And when you're too broad, you can't serve the needs of your customers in as effective way because you have too many different use cases and you have too, too many different types of customers. So there's no panacea, there's no absolute answer. But I would say, Paz, that I encourage people to really understand the exact value proposition for the most important use case for their specific niche customers, but it can't be so niche that the opportunity for like the business is not, you know, a hundred million dollar, let's say business opportunity. If it's super niche, it's harder to get funding. But I think people don't, people tend to be too broad, not niche. Always, That's my answer. Pause. Thank you. Could I also just add something to that? Is there more potential growth in terms of starting from a seed, so to speak? Is there more growth yeah. there in terms of having that unique usp that you may have more growth Thousands. more value more profitability in, in those in those ways yes yes so at meetup for example we'll have a group that's a hiking group and then some women might split off and it'll be like it'll grow from a hiking group to a, a women hiking group and then from the women hiking group um the the, the lesbian um women in the women hiking group might split off and say it's a lesbian women's hiking group and then the um the tech group that are the tech lesbian women hikers might split up and say it's a tech women. So meaning you go from like a very specific an, an area and there's always multiple opportunities that you could grow from with that. And it's about creating options for yourself. So I do fundamentally believe that there's greater value in being more niche in the beginning than, than being too broad in the beginning. And I see it happen over and over and over and over again that founders do not create amazing experiences for their for their for their clients and customers because they try to stay too broad in order to like not have to make a decision about who their the right constituency really is. So I totally agree, pause. Cool. All right. In the interest of time, I don't want to take up too much of your time, David. I promise you you'll be off of this call by eight. But I do have one question from Ari and we have two more questions okay. left. But you know, um Ari's question was uh, you know, just in the quick answers. All right. How do you balance when two principles potentially conflict? I mean, you know, that's a, that's a tough one because it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's rel relatively broad, but I would say that the, probably the most important one they're in kind of order is around understanding your biases. Everyone needs to understand themselves first and foremost to become an effective leader. Like if, if a leader said to me, hey, I'm in therapy to become a better leader, I would like, oh my God, yes. Like the more you can understand about yourself and your own tendencies and your own motivations and your own biases, the more effective leader you're going to be. And to me, that's the penultimate kind of one that, that should be prioritized among, uh, you know, among everything else. Maybe the second one is to be kind and to just treat every people, person the way that you would want to be treated. But I would say biases is number one and try to really recognize those first and foremost. What are the last two questions? And I'll answer them super fast. Yes. Go Sage. And then Esther, okay. Hi, um, so my name is Sage and I'm an MBA student at Tel Aviv University. Um, and so- we I was at Tel Aviv today, Sage. I went to the really? Anna Museum. No yeah. way, no way. Right. Um, yeah, so really great place. You understand the innovation and entrepreneurial spirit they have there with Tal Ventures, with amazing professors. And so we're all the time making decisions and I'm in the process of trying to build a business. And um, I guess it's like, how do you, because you're talking about all these decisions, it seems like once I make it, I can't turn back. Like, no, no, keep going once forward. you make it, it's about trans trapdoor decisions, non trapdoor decisions. Just always ask yourself the same question. Is this a trapdoor decision that I can't change or not? And almost always 
there are very few chapter decisions and you could almost always change a decision that you made and figure out. It might so, be hard. It might take a year, two years. So my follow-up question is how do investors take it when you decide to make a change? Because they, it's not only you. More, the right investor respects it. They respect the fact that you learned a lot from it. They respect that you may have made a mistake or failed at something. And the more that you could acknowledge a mistake that you made and the learning from it, the more off appealing you are to an investor. No one wants an egotistical founder who most often doesn't know most of anything and, and thinks that they have all the answers. It's far better to talk about the challenges that you've had and the mistakes that you made and the learnings that you've had from those mistakes and the pivots that you've made than anything. Because investors invest behind the person and the person is making pivots and it's great and pivots are appreciated as long as there's a good reason for them. Okay, so I want you on my board. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> okay, ask the last, the last question, question and then we can wrap up. Uh, first of all, David, thank you so much. I, um, I want to read your book, but I'm going to give it to my son that just got out of the army because I oh. want him to feel confident that he can make a decision and then make another decision. If it doesn't work, you can always pivot. So I think it's very important for our kids as well. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you, we, we love Meetup because we love to meet people in person. Obviously now it's such a challenge to do that. What's the future for Meetup? Is it person, online, combination of both, I guess like everything else, what's gonna be the sweet spot in the future? Yeah, the sweet spot in the future is we were getting to 75% in person, 25% online. We'll be at 85% probably in person, 80 to 85% in person, 10 to 15% online. And online is important. If it wasn't for online, and if it's raining outside or whatever it is, we couldn't do it. If it wasn't for online, we couldn't have a meetup event across 30 different countries, right? Or 50 countries. There's a lot of value to online in terms of cross geographic kind of learning opportunities. If you have this super niche interest in something and there's only not that many people around the world that have that same interest, you can create a meetup around it and have a billion, you know, not a billion, but 57 million people potentially to pull from than just the people in like Herzliya or just the people in, you know, Ramata Sharon or in, in whatever city. But the magic happens in person. The magic happens in person. The real connections happen in person. So ultimately what's going to happen is most groups are going to be uh, online and, uh, excuse me, in person, but give potential events at, as online events. So they're going to have a group that's like uh, a board game group, board game playing group, right? To play strategy board games like Settlers of Catan or whatever. Most of those board game meetups are going to be in person, but on occasion, they're going to maybe create some that are also going to be available for online. And maybe then you get the best of both worlds you get to meet all these people that are from cross geographies but the action and the real power happens in person and that's the future we're going to get back to in person the metaverse stuff is whatever virtual reality is whatever i know i sound like an old guy but but we are too biologically um we are too biologically you know influenced in in who we are from a hunter gatherer days of the importance of community to survive to 100,000 years later, to the importance of community to thrive. And it comes down to our DNA, it comes down to what works for every human being, and that's gonna be the future. So I'll just end with that and just say thank you everyone for the opportunity to meet you, to, to share a little bit about Meetup, a little bit about decision-making, and I'm so glad you tuned in. And hopefully, you know, feel free to share this with, with others as well. And thank you so much to um, Rena and to and to Ellie and to the whole group and I'm just uh, appreciative for the time. Thank you so thank much. You very thank much. you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Reza. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> bye, bye, everyone. Bye. Take care. Bye, bye.